This is fantastic. We, uh, the DGC, are so happy to work with the Vancouver International Film Festival on this series. Uh, it really places filmmakers at the very center of uh, the discussion, uh, as does the festival generally. Uh, and of course, so does the Directors Guild of Canada. We're particularly happy to collaborate with the with VIF because um, feature film is also, you know, this object which is in full flux and full transition in a most interesting way. Uh, the, at the Directors Guild, we've tried to, to sort of think about feature film as other platforms arise in a hundred different ways. We always return to the notion that it really is the bedrock, the very root of what we do as filmmakers. Um, you know, today was a fantastic march, the climate march. I got all the way to City Hall. It was pretty exciting until I realized I had to get back here um, faster than the march. Uh, the, you know, what was so apparent, you know, young people working hard to make the planet better, is that, you know, we're all really, we have an obligation to work very hard on civil society and all of its manifestations. And, you know, at the Directors Guild, and I dare say probably you, and certainly the Vancouver Film Festival, we believe art is at the very center of that exercise. We believe that, of course, we, as humans, really have a drive to express ourselves. It's the very beginning of how we model our society and our interactions with one another. Um, you know, so for, for the Directors Guild, this is important because we're a union. But unlike almost every other union, we feel that we derive our influence not just from our numbers and from the expertise of our members and from the economics of what we do for our members, but also from um, the, the, the notion of voice, of expression, of making things on the screen, of making art. Uh, we derive an outsized influence uh, as a union from the very fact that we are artists. Uh, and of course, uh, it, it goes without saying uh, that to be associated with our, our member, Adam Agoyan, and with his partner for many, many years, Arsene Kanjian, knowing you know, uh, how much uh, incredibly focused work uh, Adam has done, uh, hewing so closely to a core sense, set of uh, obsessions, of interests, uh, a body of work now that has spanned several decades, it's not over. Um, uh, this is something that gives us immense pride. It's, uh, it has put so many of us on the map. So in this room, there may be a few people who are thinking, you know, 16 feature films, uh, 27 writing credits, 40 credits overall. I'm going to beat them. And you know, the Directors Guild of Canada, you may be at exactly the age where you may be thinking that. The Directors Guild of Canada is planning to be there to help you do that. And I dare say, given his uh, record in mentorship, Adam will be too. Uh, for those of us who may be a little uh, further along and are doing things differently, uh, of course, tonight what I'd really love to do on our behalf is pick Adam's brain, brains about how he relentlessly gets back to the drawing board and creates what he creates. Uh, you know, in good weather or bad, uh, no matter how things have gone, in great success, in mixed success, Adam makes another script, makes another film, recruits support for that film, and takes it into the world fearlessly, uh, and then does it again. I think we can learn a lot from this. Um, so uh, for us at the Guild, this is a great thing. We're also very happy, uh, I'm very proud of how Adam has stood up for other filmmakers through the Guild as well. So that's my long speech about how great Adam is. Oh, thank you. And I'll sit. Thank you. So here we are, we're, we're sort of uh, at this stage of your career, Adam, where, you know, we've, we've witnessed not only the work, but also the kind of the muscularity of your process. And I, I'm, I'm, I'd love to, today to sort of, um, sort of bear down on that. This is a master class. Um, how many people, by the way, have seen the film? Oh, great. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, how many people really mind if we get into some spoilers? Okay. Okay, well, too bad. Um, this is a master class, damn it. Um, what I'd like to do is, is sort of work with, with, with Guest of Honor because you have said, and others have too, that in its DNA it, it bears um, some sort of uh, familial ties, if you will, with works um, sort of spanning the period between, um, between the adjuster and Felicia's journey. Uh, you know, the adjuster, Exotica, um, you know, Sweet Hereafter, uh, Calendar, Ararat, uh, Felicia's journey. Have I missed? Have I missed one? No, that's pretty good. Um, I, 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 as you say, that probably even going back to maybe speaking parts as well. Uh, that now that I think of it, just this idea of uh, uh, stories which are told uh, in multiple timelines and uh, where there are characters who are trying to 
locate themselves within some sort of uh, familial situation or some paradigm where they are feeling dislocated. So there's a, a strategy, I suppose. There's an architecture which uh, makes those films similar. Uh, it may be the only thing I can do, uh, but that fascinates me where the viewer is actually participating in a process that the characters themselves are engaged in, trying to understand how they fit in some way. Um, and uh, in this particular film, and I've experimented with that before, um, there are image systems that have not been fully processed or where there are competing versions of what might have happened. Uh, and there's a negotiation involved, uh, not only between the characters, but also with the viewer. So they're, they're quite interactive that way. If, if, and I suppose this is what we'll be talking about, if the viewer chooses to engage in that process, it's not for everyone. And, um, but hopefully, if you tune into that frequency, it's something which uh, can potentially take you to a place which is unexpected. Um, I come from theater, and uh, in theater, that is very much part of the process, that you are involved in a construction. You go into a space and you know that um, these are sets, uh, these people are on a stage, and it's going to take some, some accommodation, some effort to make that a reality to you. But when you cross into that, it's very powerful. Once you uh, are able to go through that fourth wall and enter that space, it's, it's really quite magical. Uh, it's not for everyone. I know people who, who can't stand, uh, and you must know this as well, like, especially people who are in the film business who can't stand live theater because they find it all so fake. Well, I'm, my sort of thumbnail theory about, the, about three types of expression uh, has often been, you know, where documentary really, you know, the audience grants you zero suspension of disbelief. You know, it must be true, it must be real. There must be signs of credibility at every instance. Uh, you know, film, uh, there's a small granting of s suspension of disbelief when the lights come down or when you, you know, pick up the remote control. There's some degree of flexibility as to how far we will go in saying, yes, that's life or that resembles real life or it alludes to my life in some way but it's limited, whereas theater, of course, we know that when the lights go down and you know they come back up on one light bulb against a brick wall, suspension of disbelief is granted willingly and wholly by most people, or at least most of my friends. Uh, and and you, see, you do sort of enter the theatrical, the world of theater or the hope of suspension of disbelief with your films perhaps more yeah. than is conventional in our trade. Certainly I, I, in my my end of the trade. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and sometimes quite, uh, when you go even further back to a film like Family Viewing, uh, which is using um, systems of live switching, uh, uh, the, where you're watching the film, but you're also aware that you're watching a soap opera uh, and you're, you're actually in that space where you actually used, we shot certain scenes, dramatic scenes uh, on tape and live switch them and cut them into the film, adding laugh tracks, adding all sorts of things which were meant to alienate the audience, if you want to use the Brechtian term. You know, th these were things that were forcing the viewer to contend with the fact that this was an artifact. But it was always tied into how that character perceived themselves. That there was something that I was trying to find, a language which allowed the viewer to understand how they saw their own reality. Um, I think what we what I'd like to do is in a few minutes get back right back into this this question of how you um, um, seem to use the toolbox uh, you know turning points in film uh, the building towards catharsis sometimes avoiding catharsis entirely uh, commendably often avoiding exploitation or manipulation except in the sense that you're describing which is the, the very careful delivery of information but in any case sensationalism for its own sake. Uh, I'd love to get into that, particularly with Guest of Honor, a little later, uh, and ask you, you know, and ask you a few questions about, you know, have you been confounding expectations, and is there a risk in that? Mm -hmm. uh, before that, though, I suppose we should watch a clip. Uh, the clip isn't going to shed a lot of light on this, but it will shed a lot of light on how you begin uh, the story of Jim in Guest of Honor, and also perhaps on some sense uh, how, how you think of sense of place. So perhaps, it would, shall we show yeah, it? Yeah, and just to say that also, Jim is in a long line of uh, uh, 
people who have these jobs, which I find really quite, quite um, Every fascinating. Man. Every yes. man jobs. You know, people who have access into our lives because there are insurance adjusters or customs officers or, uh, in this case, a food inspector, um, that they like grants them access into the lives of these characters who are strangers to them. And it's also people taking, seeing their jobs in a very odd way, like that they, uh, there's a, a mythology that they create a, about themselves, right? So he, uh, um, you know, he's a troubled man. He's dealing uh, with a, a family situation which is really incomprehensible to him. His, his daughter is in jail for a crime which is unspeakable in a way and that she may or may not have uh, committed and he's uh, the film intercuts these moments where he's in visiting his daughter in jail and trying to comfort her or f figure out why or how she might have done what she professes to have done so this is all in his mind as he's doing these inspections and so a lot of uh, his thoughts uh, are with her as he's going about his job and so this notion of distraction, people doing things, but actually thinking about something else or projecting someone else as they're going about these activities um, is also an important part of these films in terms of how uh, it, it, the films have a very particular tone. And I'm glad you're finding the humor because there is a, there is a, a sardonic um, sort of sensibility. Now, some audience will take it very seriously. When we had the premiere of this film in Venice, it was very quiet and people were very, very serious about it. But uh, the, the best audiences are the ones, like last night was, uh, I didn't see the whole screening, but people are, are, are understanding that there is uh, an element of humor as well. But again, it's not, as you suggested, it's not conventional. It's not that the signifiers of that are, are are, are pounded you know into your head it's it's it, it could be taken in a number of different ways um, it, uh, it seems to me too that what we think we're tracking is his interest in his job and as you've just said of course in the back of his mind is his you know are all his other thoughts particularly around Veronica his daughter played by Liza de Oliveira who's awesome wonderful she I worked with her for seven months on on this new show called lock and key which will drop imminently um, she, she, of course, is a, a complex being in his life. He can't figure her out. We are having trouble decoding her. One of the interesting things is we think we're tracking his work as a food inspector, and in an, a much later scene, we find him going through a very elaborate, almost procedural uh, set of moves to frame a restauranter. We think probably in the first degree as a food inspector, but in fact his real reason is to find out more about his daughter's situation. Right. And so that becomes clear. The onion is sort of peeled a little bit further there. So in the in this sort of the question of tracking what, finding, knowing what information matters in your films, but in this film in particular, what we also know is the film starts with Veronica meeting this priest, Father Greg, um, played by Luke Wilson, and sitting down to tell a story and the first thing we find ourselves wondering is how reliable is this narrator which is true of course of so many of your films um, we uh, then also have to ask the question is this narrator truly telling the story or is Adam Agoyan telling the story and, and as you say it's a very managed process and so we you know as uh, from a distance I start wondering whose point of view we're in we start in, in, in we start in uh, obviously in Veronica's. We know that the priest is listening intention, intently. We don't we we we're led to believe he doesn't know anything about the story. We find out later he knows quite a bit more than he's letting on, uh, and yet then we go into this sequence with Jim where we appear to be in his point of view. So would you? Um, is there any sort of formal sort of method here, or are you feeling your way through this process of transferring point of view? Well, you used a very interesting term, and I've been searching for that in terms of describing uh, what's at the spine of this particular story, and that's managed process. So it's a managed process of uh, narration. Ultimately, what we discover with the scenes with, between the priest and Veronica, the father has asked to have his funeral at this church. From the very beginning of the film, the priest says it's, this is very a very unusual request because he's never come to this church, as far as I know. So we can we can certainly provide that service, but it is odd that he's chosen this church. 
as we begin to understand that the priest actually has a familiarity with his fam family and, and the particular circumstances and the tragedy that has kind of befallen uh, Jim, um, we might begin to understand, and the film doesn't make this clear, but for me it was very clear, that Jim has actually managed this narration. He has asked for this uh, funeral there because he knows that part of that would be that there would be a eulogy and that his daughter would have to meet the priest. And we understand, and again, spoiler alert, that, that there is something that he could never tell his daughter because she would never believe him, but that there might be a chance that the priest, as, a, as, a, as somebody who's observed this, would give this crucial bit of evidence. P post Jim's death. Post so Jim's death. Jim so delivers the answer posthumously through a bit of a ruse, and we are coming to know him as one who's really capable of multiple totally ruses. Totally capable of that. And actually, uh, as, as a child who's been raised by somebody like that, that's how she also is capable of ruses. Uh, you know, she is in prison because of a ruse that she's constructed around an event that did not happen, uh, that she abused her position of authority with uh, students during a band trip. Again, spoiler alert, but uh, that did not happen. However, she did certainly transgress certain boundaries, and we see that in the film. Uh, didn't go as far as she said, but um, so this notion of these characters that are involved in these very elaborate um, machinations uh, where they, try and construct an intimacy, or they try and um, position something. In this case, I think the father has tried to protect the daughter from something that happened around the time she was 10 years old, but hasn't really effectively done that and doesn't want to claim responsibility for not having done that because it's just too terrifying for him uh, for a number of reasons. I'm not going to get into the details, but it's just all of that is part of the construction of the piece. So I'm trying to find a, a way of telling this very complex story. When you talk about the ruse that he plays on the, on the restaurant, I mean, he, he discloses in that restaurant, I've been trying to get in touch with your son, the restaurant owner's son. We have not seen him do that. So there's a whole narrative in the film, which in a conventional movie, we would have seen. We would have seen him try to access, he says, I've tried, I've, I've tried calling you, I've tried sending you emails, there's no response. So he's resorted to this other way of having him seated across the table so he can confront him. But we're not in on that until it's actually brought up. And that could be frustrating for the viewer, except we are in on another thing which we can let our imagination uh, get excited by, which is that, oh my God, he might be trying to bribe this restaurant. That might be uh, his modus operandi. It's exciting. And it, then of course, you, you, he throws it away and therefore so do you as you have certain other plot points as, as you advanced. So to the question of, to the, 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 the sort of the word frustration, um, you, it, um, it's very interesting to sort out what you care about when you're telling yeah. a story, uh, particularly from the point of view of uh, audiences and, and perhaps even practitioners who are accustomed to uh, when a clue is given that that clue is going to be used to construct jeopardy, make things worse, make things more exciting, make things blow up. Maybe some, you know, maybe right. somebody dies. Uh, you know, cars may go fast. Uh, quite often, and there are several instances in this film where the, this, this clue is given and it is used for a completely different purpose by you. I'll give the example. In one instance, um, we, uh, we find Mike, played by Ross of Sutherland, sneaking uh, onto the bus where all the cell phones have been uh, left um, by, on, you know, because Veronica said, leave the cell phones on the bus. Uh, and he, t he, he, he fraudulently sort of texts um, to, um, uh, to uh, Clive on, on, on Veronica's phone. You know, in, in any other movie, this would be the beginning of a very exciting uh, you know, psychological thriller or suspense thriller in the first degree. Um, very quickly, everybody knows, however, in your story, that everybody acknowledges Mike did it. So there's no suspense there. That, you know, that immediately, that piece of sort of exi exciting possible jeopardy is abandoned. They know it and they begin to plot 
a much more sort of interesting extension uh, of your story, which is we're going to mess with them, and it becomes clear that Veronica really is on a bit of a, a, a you know a, a self-destructive uh, spiral because of other things that matter much more to you, which is her guilt over something far more important, which is of course, uh, you know, this terrible death that's occurred, uh, two terrible deaths that have occurred, and so uh, you have used this to simply get a little further along, whereas in my movie it. It would have been the beginning of a very, you know, a, a very nice piece of plotting for, a, you know, a very scary sequence of about 45 to 50 minutes. And you are uh, working in a popular medium. I mean, uh, that's that's the difference. And, and you are you've helmed these uh, these extraordinary series, which are uh, which are engineered to be seen by a lot more people than we'll ever see this movie. Uh, and and I'm aware of that, you know, and so the times that I've I've been in. I've had contact with popular culture, uh, have been uh, a, a TV film I did for the CBC on Spinner Spencer uh, called Gross Misconduct. But even that, I mean, it was written by uh, Paul Gross and it was, a, a, it was presented to me as a very linear script and I just had this idea of breaking it up into these two parallel lines between father, father's trajectory. It's an amazing story. I won't get into the details of it, but uh, I remember Paul just, uh, just outraged, you know, well, there's the script, either you're going to make that script or not, but then coming back three weeks later with this kind of new structure, and I thought, wow, that's very generous of you. But it probably made the film, which has been seen by a lot of people at the time, but it made it that much more challenging. Uh, I would say something like Chloe, uh, which was also not my script, um, but I was very fascinated by those machinations, by by those ruses, and what, what what was going on between those characters. But it ended in a in a way that in the original script I found absolutely unacceptable, and I fought against it only to realize as we were doing the test screenings, oh my God, that would have been a better ending if I wanted a larger audience. Um, so it's not that I'm act actively trying to um, marginalize myself. But it's just what I feel, you know, like I, I feel this is how that story should be told. But I am also aware that it's not the conventional way of telling it. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm in awe of, you know, people who really are able to understand what a lot of people would like to watch and are able to construct um, a, a, a project which satisfies that. Because it's not in my... Um, wheelhouse, as they say. It's just not what I, what I, what I do. But I'm, um, I'm excited to have this type of conversation because it, it makes me feel like when you talk about that moment where he takes her uh, cell phone and uh, manipulates it, well, there is another character, uh, this boyfriend that, who has committed suicide after leaving a suicide note on her cell phone. So the, it's strange that these two male characters are actually deploying her own technology there, you know, to actually um, uh, find access t to her. Well, and that that uh, that moment with the the second moment with the cell phone when Walter is filming himself gets the full treatment. I mean, from the ultra conventional point of view, that you know, uh, my you know, you are very methodical in setting that up in providing a moment of of of, of, of huge shock. Uh, you know, qu quite classically, because it seems to me that's the piece of information that actually matters, and all, all these sort of what appeared to be false starts or perhaps small letdowns were, were just on the journey toward this much right. more important moment from your perspective, uh, you, know, to your, you know, to the kind of the uh, notion of a managed process. Um, the question, I guess, and I think you've answered it, is, you know, with these sort of small sort of, they're not disappointments, but these moments where a beat that was, you know, had all held all this promise for escalation. It doesn't turn out to be the beat you're going to play. I guess, uh, you know, sometimes I feel it, there's a trickster in you, sort of at work as well, where you're you're well aware that you're setting us up and, you know, letting us down in order to sort of play with this issue of the unreliable narrator. In some sense, you too are the unreliable mm -hmm. narrator, um, uh, and 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 you, of course. 
then the question from a purely kind of architectural point of view is what about catharsis? I mean, if you're messing around, messing with us so hard for two thirds of the film, are you really going to get the film to gel properly emotionally? Because, you know, the score is saying this thing you, that you believe absolutely in the emotional lives of your characters. They're lush, they're beautiful, they're committed. The performances are ultra committed. Uh, the filmmaking is impeccable. Um, when you're when you're when you're in this in this form feature film and um, having a few false starts on purpose, uh, what sort of challenge do you pose yourself in Act Three in terms of winding things up? That's a, that's a great question, and uh, uh, I think that's where the risk is. Like, will will the Act Three come together? And uh, uh, my favorite endings of my uh, my films, my own scripts, are where um, something was revealed in the creative process that I wasn't anticipating in Exotica. It was the fact that uh, uh, this, 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 this woman who's dancing for the Bruce Greenwood character was in fact the babysitter of his murdered daughter. That happened quite late. And I remember when, I, when, I, when that was given to me, and I do think these things are given to you, I just almost began to cry. I was going, oh my God, that's the, that unlocks it. And that scene will be at the end. And, and, um, and that will be um, that will reverberate through our entire experience of the film, uh, and I was so grateful when that when that just uh, and 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 I think you feel that moment of discovery in the film. That's the amazing thing about the cinematic process. The, what is that? Those decisions, as you are well aware, are are actually felt. The camera has this uncanny ability not only to show you what's in front of the lens, but the feeling of those people behind it, and. Uh, uh, and, and I think narrative form also has this incredible way of showing you uh, through the way you're using image and music and gesture and camera movement and all those things, um, that sense of discovery. So I'm not sure if the third act in this film works entirely well, because for me that moment is that we're seeing the scene with him in his final uh, a restaurant. He actually leaves his uh, case behind because he realizes at that point he's quite ill. Uh, you know, he, he uh, the, he's dead at the beginning of the film. Uh, it's, n it's never really said how he's how he's died, but it's. I, I, but you're holding you're holding your pancreas. So. I, because he was as well. You know, he was he he's talking about a cancer during that final speech. So I think it, it that's what I suspect it is. So um, he at that in the final scene, I think realizes, oh, I will have my my funeral at this church and that I will have this priest deliver my eulogy and my truth will then become revealed to my daughter which is and, and, and yet he fights so hard to maintain uh, you know your, the characters never seem to lie the truth is aloof is, is completely elusive but nobody seems to lie except Jim on this one point which is he never he never had an affair with the music teacher what is this spoiler number 50. Uh, but but then the, that's also. But he's fighting point. like crazy did, not to because and and the answer is. Did he that, consummate the affair though? Maybe he's not lying. Maybe maybe the wife had given him permission. And again, spoil, like, unless it doesn't matter at this point. We're just talking. We're talking about the mechanics of how the film is being told. So whether or not. And I'm not sure after this discussion you're going to want to see the film because it's just like it seems like oh my oh, god. Oh, it's really good. You got to see it. <laughs> but 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 the but the fact is we never see them consummate the affair. Uh, certainly we get the impression that the wife. This is this is the thing is that. A 10-year-old girl, um, uh, her mother is dying of cancer, uh, her father's having an affair with her music teacher who she adores. So uh, the father has has, thinks that he's protected her from the knowledge of that affair. Uh, and unbeknownst to her, it, the, the, his dying wife has given him permission to have that affair. Um, and uh, he could never tell that to a 10-year-old girl. Like That wouldn't make any sense. And it would just be so incomprehensible to her. So, and something then terrible happens to the music teacher, which the daughter uh, was complicit in. Uh, and I won't give that away. But the point is that uh, we don't actually know if he consummated the affair. What we do understand is that he thinks he's protected his daughter from any sense that that was happening, that there was an attraction or that that possibility was, was there. And what he finds now, many years later, 15 years later, is that uh, he would, it's, it's easier for him to deny that that, that that happened. Because if he says it did happen, the circumstances under which it happened, which is that his wife allowed him to have that affair, would just 
seem preposterous to his daughter because of their their terrible relationship. She would just not trust that that's what happened. So in fact, it, he really did have to do it, you know, deliver this information posthumously in this church, um, which he's come to know through his, um, I guess, through his mistress, uh, Alicia, who did attend the church. Right. And so Father Gregory, who never utters a religious word in the entire film. And actually breaks a vow by actually... By, giving a confession, like, you know, yeah. breaking his version of a Hippocratic oath. No, no. Uh, disclosure. Uh, yeah. He can't, uh, he can't, he does. He's, he, he just reveals it. And I suppose he's so involved with her story that, that he, he sort of is granted license right. uh, by the film to, to do so. Um, the, um, the, it, it, I, as I listen to you, um, it also occurs to me, uh, uh, you know, among, among, among great auteurs, um, you know, you need a lot of plot. To, to sort of work this quite, this investigative process uh, around truth <clears throat> and loyalty and um, and internal truth, uh, you you really do need a lot of story to get yeah. to get the film made. There's uh, and then and then you take story away, right? So in in the script there might be more. I mean, a, a lot of those those uh, those plot elements are explored, and sometimes, and this is the problem when you're budgeting a, a film like this, there are actual scenes that are shot. So the, uh, the, the music teacher dies in a fire, which we shot, uh, but then we felt we didn't need. Um, so the, the trick is when you're working with a limited budget uh, to understand what it is you're gonna actually need and not to waste time. We had 22 days to shoot this film. Uh, so we were moving very quickly. It was very ambitious. So. Um, uh, as opposed to a film, we were talking about Devil's Knot, uh, where uh, you know there's a lot of plot, there's a lot of, uh, but I, I wanted to shoot it all because I wasn't quite sure how it was going to uh, fit into the final form. In this case, we had to be quite, we need to anticipate what's going to be needed, and and because uh, we can't go back and reshoot, we can't we can't uh, and 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 we can't shoot everything. Um, so it's it's a. Uh, it's a tricky thing to manage, right? And and uh, and the worst thing is when you feel that as you're editing, you don't have the material that you need to actually tell the story properly, uh, or or, and this is also because I'm working so much on long takes or camera movements that there are things within those moves that and that people are saying that you want to take out, mm -hmm. you know, because they they no, no longer are relevant, but you're locked into a, a particular gesture. That's that's very frustrating. So as you're shooting to be able to anticipate, OK, is there a version of this where we don't have that line? If there's any sense that, that line is not going to make it uh, to the final version, we need to then also shoot a version of this where the actor doesn't say that line, because I can't physically cut it out in the editing process. So all of that type of stuff is what you're thinking about as you're shooting whilst you're also trying to look for surprises. You know, you're in a restaurant and, and your actor discovers something um, and they're just, you're, you're excited by that. And again, the other thing that the camera is able to convey is just, as I said, that excitement of the moment where, you know, you have a performance, you have a gesture, the camera is in the right place, framing that gesture, and uh, it's just a gift. It's, it's like a lightning in a bottle. So you have to give space for that as well as you're shooting. You know all of this, but most of you as directors know this as well. It's the hardest thing to balance because you're always running against a clock. And, um, and, and actors might always want to have another take. Or, uh, so all of this is part of what you're trying to absorb uh, as this very, you know, um, it, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's like there's a, there's a factory that's been set up for, the, for you know, during the, the pre-production, you know, it, it's an image-making machine uh, and you have all of these elements but you don't really have the finished product, the prototype, until the end of the editing process and the sound and the music. But you only have this 25 day or 30 day or 20 day or 15 day period in which to, to accumulate all the material you need. So that's, that's a challenge, absolutely. It's what makes our jobs very, very specific because we need to uh, time manage and we need to uh, be able to think of disasters that are going to happen or not happen while we're in this very uh, engaged in this process. Fabulous. Hey, could I get a show of hands of people who may want to ask questions so that I can, um, you know, even if you don't know yet what the question is, but you have this urge to get into the chat. So that's quite a few. That's good. So we'll, we're going to knock this conversation off in just a few minutes and, and get to questions. That's fantastic. Please do jump in. The most fun thing, apart from watching 
all of Adam's films again in three days uh, is chatting with Adam. So I encourage you to get into a chat. Um, speaking of uh, filmmaking, I know we agreed that we wouldn't talk about shots because you know the shots seem to sort of be in the t in tow to the to you know to the to the to the theme, the idea, the goal. And when there are a couple of other little bits of uh, little atomisms, I'd still I'd like to get into in terms of representation. But nonetheless, you know, one is witnessing very confident direction, uh, un 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 unfussy. Uh, very much to the point, um, poetic when it needs to be, responding to the material material you're very familiar with, having written it. Um, what is your sort of general outlook on, um, you know, the role of the principal camera, not the additional cameras, and the sort of the fun sort of layerings, almost Rashomon-like layerings of perspective? But how do you how do you feel about filming your stories and 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 where the camera and where preparation, you know, scene design visually uh, fits into your world now, th this many films in? Well, I, I have a very very specific relationship with my director of photography, Paul Sarasi, because we we've made all these films together, and uh, I. Uh, so I'm responsible for the framing and the camera move, um, and Paul's responsible for the light. So we'll discuss what we want the light to be in terms of the tone, but the actual construction of that, um, I've learned to really, and, and because the frame is so specific, he's able to light in a very specific way as well. So I never come in and say, I want to see all three, I want to have access to you know, the, full, the full set. And matter of fact, that also helps with my production design as well, where I say, I'm going to be looking at this part of the room. And, and, and the production designer will always say, well, let me just give you all of this so that uh, the actors are going to feel that they inhabit this space. And all this stuff, I'm going, yes, if we had all the money in the world, we could do that, but we don't. This is what I'll be seeing. Again, um, presumably very much a shorthand with a production designer you've worked with a lot, Philip Barker. Philip Barker, who's who's actually nominated for a DGC award as my, as my editor. But I think you know these are people that are Susan Shipton, Susan with Shipton. whom he's uh, Adam has worked a great uh, uh, deal and uh, is very active at the DGC. Get involved, get involved. <laughs> so 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 it, it is when you're working with a limited budget, you know, to preconceive, to pre-visualize, and to be able to communicate that. Uh, and to work with people who understand uh, that that's, that's how it will actually work, as opposed to you know, go, well, I know I'm going to get, I'm, I know that on the day the director's going to want to look at this as well. And I hear stories of that from my collaborators who work with other directors. And I go, I, having not been on other people's sets, I just don't understand how directors don't pre-visualize and how they don't, uh, you know, when they're doing a survey, they they can you know say uh, okay I'll be looking this way park the unit here but I've heard of stories where the director will then come on the set and say no actually I want to look here and you just go why would you shoot yourself in the foot like that I know who told you that story and about whom okay good <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we and we'll uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll leave it there we'll leave it there yeah um, the um, I'd like to um, ask you a few questions about uh, the, the, the phones. I forgot my phone at home in a sort of a Freudian tribute, uh, you know, homage to, to Adam's portrayal of phones <laughs> in this in this film. And I think Val, Val, Valerie Creighton forgot hers yesterday also, I think, as a, as a sign of respect. Mine is honestly, I realized I've left it on. So there, there you go. So that makes up for both of your transgressions. And mine is actually not off, which is, I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm not gonna turn it off now because it'll create tension. Well, it's so, <laughs> it, it, it's so, it's so interesting that in many, many of your films, um, filming technology or the media technology has been so big it's been so present, and here we're down to texting. We're down to, but it's easily the most invasive and most intrusive sort of manifestation of these sort of additional bits of, mm -hmm. of, of recording technology. The selfie and texting seem to be, uh, and, and you know. But also the recording, right? I mean, the, the suicide note is recorded, and, and it's kept on her phone. That's right. right. So, 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 so what's interesting about Veronica is that this was a, a, t a, a recording from, a, from that period, not so long ago, when uh, you couldn't just download your images or they weren't in a cloud. Uh, if, you, if you kept it on your phone, that's where it was. So the phone itself has been quite fetishized as well. Oh, right. the, the elaborate filming yeah. of char charge, finding the phone right. alongside a rabbit foot, charging the phone, waiting for the phone right. to charge, coming back to it, yes. discovering the information, yeah. the horrifying information in the phone, the phone then travels to prison where a confrontation right. occurs. Yeah. Um, and this is just the concert. Um, the, um, but this phone is so tiny compared to sort of other things that have interested you in the past about, about uh, you know, 
uh, for instance, entire sitcoms in, in family viewing. And, and mm. uh, it, it just seems like uh, the smaller the object in this case, the, the larger, to the point where, of course, Veronica insists on everyone leaving their phones on the bus and we go back to some sort of pre-smartphone phone society. Uh, where people aren't literally texting next to one another right. instead of living next to one another. And it seems that commentary is quite thoroughgoing yeah. and, and, of course, built straight into the plot. Um, is this uh, is there an additional commentary, sort of in so societal terms, about uh, about the role phones are playing, or was well, it like, a, a, like all, or was it a great device? No, it's just like all technologies. I've used a lot of technologies uh, in all my films from the from the first one, thirty five years ago, Next of Kin, which had a videotape. Uh, in therapy sessions, which was actually based, a friend of mine at the time worked as a videographer in a, in a therapy clinic where they were videotaping sessions. Um, and so how that video comes back into that character's trajectory um, as he remembers his previous family through videotape. I mean, technology is just this, this a way that we are able to uh, assert aspects or assign aspects of our own experience onto these devices, which um, can then either uh, be used as a reference or can use as a sort of a self-flagellation system, right? Because no one remembers things as clearly as a piece of technology will uh, transcribe them. And uh, we, uh, we record a lot more than we will ever watch. But this idea that all of that is somehow stored and that we have access to it uh, at any point gives us some sort of a comfort, but it's also quite ominous because it suggests that uh, the natural process of filtering memory is now forever um, mitigated by uh, this very uh, objectified uh, resource that can actually be shared by people um, that you don't have control over. Uh, and that's becoming we, something that we, in, in the assigning of our privacy rights, you know, we, we become sort of tired by this issue. And so we just take it for granted that other people will be intercepting uh, uh, aspects of our private life. And that's what happens in this film. I mean, quite directly. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm showing a small, um, as you said, it's, it's, it's a tiny, in some ways, plot point, but it actually has a huge significance in terms of the, the, the culture these people are living in. Uh, as does, let's say, the Me Too movement. You know, uh, she is this strange, um, the, the, the teacher, she's someone who's using the, the, the current um, um, dialogue um, and she's, she's um, able to actually put herself in prison by making herself a perpetrator while she is also at the same time a victim of this sort of patriarchal uh, desire to control narrative. Right. The, that, that's of sort of what's at the in the core of the film. Like, yeah, you know, the father has controlled the narrative, or thought he's controlled the narrative that she's trying to break out of, but she's then using this uh, this climate that we're in to try and find her own narrative, but not in a conventional way. It's quite transgressive, in fact, what she's done. You know, it's so interesting having these conversations because, in fact, you know, you read reviews and you go, no one talks about this stuff at all, right? I mean, it's just like you read reviews and you go, oh, it's just it's, it's muddled or it's like, I'm going, you know, if you just take some time, it's not. But you raise this point of like, well, how much time does anyone have with a film? And that's, as you said before, the, the aspiration of the feature film is that we're asking for an hour and a half of concentrated viewing space. Uh, coming from theater, I've come to understand and expect that when people come into a, a theater, they're going to be there for an hour and a half or two hours, or if you're doing the, the Mahabhatra by Peter Brooks, eight hours, you know, like, but that is time that you are actually committed to that space. Uh, and that's, I suppose, what I'm mourning a little bit, you know, through these devices is that, um, you know, do we still have that, that attention span and do we have that ability to uh, break down what these intentions are? Or do we just find the quickest way of dismissing it because it's easier to do that and we can move on to the next thing that's waiting for us on our neck or whatever. Like, there's so much stuff to absorb right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, I intercut most of your films with episodes of Glow. That was uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're designed for that, specifically. But, you know, so... Well, you, you so kind of put in little signals. You know, Tim, watch Atlanta right now. <laughs> um, I think that's a great place, uh, because I, th I hope we expand on it to sort of uh, ask for uh, qu questions from the room. Uh, a hand went up straight away. Yes, sir. Hi, Adam. Hi. Um, how do you start? So you say there are 
like scripts are coming to you or scripts that you are kind of envisioning, but how the process even starting, how do you choose from all those stories and then start to make them complicated? <laughs> by, by, by writing and by, I, I, I write and uh, I see what, what holds. And sometimes I, 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 this, this film went through many different incarnations. Uh, and uh, um, th this character lasted and stayed with me for a very long time. Um, so you give yourself this freedom to, to write and, and to see what and how uh, certain things percolate. Um, and that's, that's how I do it. How, now when I get someone else's script, it's a whole different process. But when I'm generating my own material, it really is this uh, idea of starting someplace and seeing if it if it if there if, if it's leading, and it, if it if it sustains an interest and an intrigue to me, and 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 that sense of place is very important. You know the these locations like the strip club of Exotica, um, the um, the deserted development of the Adjuster, abandoned development site where these people are living, um, the rest the restaurants that he's going into here, um, and uh, the sense of uh, there, that something feels mysterious to you. Something feels more significant than it might appear. And you're wondering why, and you need to explore that. Um, or there's something in your own life, sometimes as well, that's important, of course. There's something that you've experienced that, that is painful, or that you're anguished by, or that you're excited by, or that thrills you and gives you joy. Um, that you just want to um, share with other people, um, in ideal, the ideal viewer, um, uh, that committed person who uh, is going to be on that journey with you. So it's a tall order. I mean, that's the hardest part most people have. It's like, who, why would anyone else be interested in this? That is, the, you know, that is the thing that blocks us, right? Why would anyone be interested in this? Oh my God, that's been told before. Or someone, you know, yes, to get rid of all of that is really tough, but it is a, it's a leap of faith that, that this is going to actually be as exciting to someone else as it is to you. Anyone else? Yes. No, you, you, exactly you. Oh, yeah. no, yeah, yell, man. No. No, you got it. Well, I'm, I'm just curious, you made a point to also include that sometimes things that are personal to you are interesting. And as a filmmaker, I've struggled sometimes to figure out, is this something that's a personal problem that the camera will somehow transcend? And now everyone in the world will be able to relate to this. And sometimes I fall into a trap, whereas other times something, I don't know if it's personally important, but it's just a universal problem and it just works. And how are you able to determine that? And throughout your career, have, have there been times where you thought, everyone's going to think this is shocking and amazing, and then you find out only your sister cares, yeah. or your mom, you know? Because that's the worst feeling a filmmaker can have. Yeah. Well, the first per person that needs to be excited is, is your actor, right? Like that, that, and because if you've written something and you're able to find that there are actors who actually uh, really genuinely get excited about that as well, inhabiting those characters. And you're excited about having them do that. That's a great place to start because those are other human beings who have already engaged in this uh, process of taking it to the next step, right? So sometimes I think as we're writing and directing, we're forgetting that uh, at some point, that's gonna be completely redefined by the people we cast. So when I watch uh, David Thewlis playing this role, uh, I'm just going, oh my, he has just, he has embraced this and he's ex he was exciting me as we were shooting it and uh, that thrill kind of builds to this incredible scene that he has at the end. And, and when we get to that scene at the end, I know that there was a specific thing I told him between take one and take two, and we only did two takes, but he transformed himself between the two takes because of something that I said to him and that's also so amazing, right? That you have the rapport with the actor at that point, that you're able to activate uh, and extend that process of uh, excitement. But, you know, it starts off, yeah, you don't know that until you actually 
get to that point. That's my feeling. So the question is, how do you write something that gets you to that point? So when I when I'm given a script that I haven't written, I go, oh my god, so much of the work is 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 you know, I'm I'm shocked sometimes that I get the same amount of uh, a credit for something that I'm directing than something that I'm like writing and directing. So like uh, I get a lot of it, you know, like Remember or Chloe. I I didn't write those, but I'm getting as much attention as the person who made those. But I I didn't make those films. I I, I directed them. They were made by. In the case of Chloe, a producer who saw a French film and decided that it could be made into an English language version of that, and and that person really made that film. You know, they had that that leap, and I get too much attention for that type of work, uh, because the real tough thing is how do you take a, a, something from nothing and raise the money to make it into this thing you're going to watch on a screen. Now, thankfully. Like we're living in a culture which, when I started making films 35 years ago, like you just needed to raise like I, the budget I made my first feature for, which I shot for fifteen thousand dollars, would still actually get you now like like a, 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 the same film uh, for even less money because of digital technology, and it would look better and it would sound better. So. Um, um, you know, we have access to, you know, that the process of storytelling becomes much more immediate and fluid because we don't have to wait to raise large amounts of money anymore. Unless you want to build things or you need to have specific locations or you want to work with, um, you know, um, actors who are in a union. I mean, that's going to, uh, you know, that's going to, that's going to add. You better more. want to work with actors in a union. Right. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> a discussion we can have outside. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. We'll wait for a mic. This I've learned. We should we should do the mic. Here it comes. And I'm going to beg now for a five minute extension. And someone can either say yes or no. Yeah, <laughs> someone someone wearing a VIF shirt. Thank thank you yeah. for being here. Yes. And um, I wondered if you could just touch on your internal compass that helps you determine. Oh no, that's going down too much of a populist, popular road, and I have to stay true to my integrity, because you you, you talked about that a lot. That you make films that maybe um, will not appeal to do, a. Do, I have to be honest. If I felt that something was going down a populist road, and 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 I really felt strongly about it, I would take that road. I mean, I seriously, if I if I felt that uh, it was true to me. And I, and, I, and I was going, oh, and this is going to actually be popular. And I felt confident about that. I would just I would run down that road faster than anyone else. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> I would be racing ahead of anyone else. Like, it's just that what I was talking about are these times where um, there, is, there is a formulaic approach, and that just bores me. Like, you know, or, or it feels really untrue. Uh, and what we're also talking about are these moments in, in, in these particular scripts where there's a convolution, which, you know, in a conversation that we had before with Tim, I was, I, was, I, was, I was getting a sense that he thought that I was, you know, purposefully subverting a convention. I, I'm not. Uh, that, the, the way that story comes out is the way I felt it. There wasn't a, a conventional approach that I'm then, then I'm subverting. Uh, I, didn't see, I didn't see, like, the, the, the path that might have made this uh, more accessible to people. And if I had, I probably might have taken that. But, um, or if someone tells me later on, well, this is going to make it more accessible to people, uh, if that feels uh, gimmicky or uh, false, I will not take it. But if, and I, I would pray that if it feels organic and real, then I will take it. So there's an interesting story about that with, with Chloe, right? Where uh, we don't have time to get into it, it doesn't matter. Another question. Let me yeah. try the go to the back. Uh, the uh, I see two hands. The person to my left, the the person with the beard. How about that? The other person with the beard. You guys can fight it out. Whoever gets the mic first. No. It Here it comes. Here? Yeah. It's, yeah. All right. Whoever reaches first. There we go. I didn't think I had a beard. Okay. Well, you don't. Um, okay. Well, I have a light in my eyes. Oh, did you want somebody else? Way to go. No, you're good. Okay. Actually, the person. And now I know you don't have a beard. Okay. <laughs> Uh, as a prolific um, director who's worked with Canada and Hollywood and around the world, what kind of responsibility do you feel to Canada to telling Canadian stories, working with Canadian cast and crew? Huge. I mean, it's it's my 
it's my country. So I, I, I feel uh, most comfortable when I'm telling a uh, Canadian story. And to me, the, the, the high point of that was when I made Sweet Hereafter, where it's an American novel, and uh, it, w it was a film that had been optioned by the studio, um, and uh, I, I convinced the writer, Russell Banks, that, that, that they would probably never make this film. At that point, he didn't think they would either. So to be able to make that film in this country, uh, set it in this province in, in British Columbia, because at the time, British Columbia was the only place that allowed a, uh, a lawyer to work on a, uh, uh, on a contingency basis, uh, like, like in the States, which was an important part of the plot. But, but, but to see those BC license plates and then uh, to, to take that film back into the States um, was, was to me a vindication of the whole system. Because that film, uh, and, this, uh, and, and my whole career would not have really been possible outside of this country. So, um, uh, and, and I do feel that when I, when I watch this film in particular, uh, um, uh, Guest of Honor, it, with, with, a, with a Canadian audience, uh, it, it, it finds a frequency which you know, is very particular to, to, um, to our condition. You know, like the way he, you know, the, the, the way the, this community he's living in is built up, you've got a taste of it there. Like everyone, as he says, everyone in this film is from somewhere else and there's a negotiation involved, and that just feels very much part of the fabric of, of this experiment we're all living. Fabulous, great question. Beard or no beard? Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. There's a beard here, yes. Oh, that's sir. I'm um, Richie next, sir. Uh, uh, as someone who's inspired by your choice of music in your films, particularly with the Exotica and the Adjuster, I'm just curious if you could shed some light on your process behind auditioning that music and marrying it to the theme and the vision of the film. You know, Exotica opens with that Leonard Cohen track and then has this kind of... It doesn't open with the Leonard Cohen track. It, it, uh, it, that's a huge, important part of the film, but okay. it opens with a with a with a, a, a motif that oh, that's the other collaborator we're talking about. Collaborator is Michael Dana. So Michael, Michael Dana, Dana. Has, has scored all my films from family viewing. So that's a very very cherished relationships, and and so very often in the films there are uh, characters who are playing music. Um, or are playing an instrument, or, or actually playing the motif sometimes that we're actually hearing. So, uh, and, and in designing these camera shots, uh, we are uh, thinking of music. You know, we're like space for music and how the music is going to work. Uh, when we're then um, auditioning, as you say, or temping, uh, Michael doesn't like to hear his own music, so then it's a question of, well, what are we going to temp it with so that we can screen it and we can edit it. So, so that. Uh, and I love music. I mean, so I, 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 I play classical guitar. I listen to a lot of music. So I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, there's, there's, there's uh, pieces of music that I have in mind. Um, and sometimes Michael will uh, use those as, as a temp track. But it's not like what happens with Chloe, which is, a, again, it's made in the, in the Hollywood machine where the, the music supervisor um, is actually composing a, a score using you know, elements of other people's scores and using their own you know, uh, programs and synthesizers, which they then test and give to a composer to replicate. You know, so that's a different process than, than what, what I'm doing. Uh, interesting process, uh, but it's, it's not the way I'm working with, with Michael. Michael does that with other people's films. And actually, I could say he probably did that with Chloe because that's how we, you know, the producer at that point had uh, some ideas that they were bringing in uh, and we were using that as a template. Uh, the, the light, the, I hit zero and the red light's flashing and I promised one more question to the gentleman and I know your shirt's blue, this I'm sure of. Um, and here comes the mic. Hi, thank you for being here. I just wanted to talk about what is your process for talking to an actor who doesn't have a screen partner and he has the scene to himself. For example, for the scene that we analyze, he's, he goes to all these different places and he's uh, seeing the, uh, how clean the restaurants are. Mm. How do you communicate and what language do you use to talk to a, an actor who doesn't have anyone to participate Oh, with? it really is about, you know, uh, is about objects and about things that he's thinking about. Uh, in this case, it was pretty easy because there is this other narrative that's going on in his mind, right? Um, but but uh, really, sometimes it's uh, it's just um, it depends on the film. It, 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 but but there's there's something that has to be going on in the actor's mind as they're performing any activity. 
Um, and, and maybe by the point you get to those scenes, you've already established a rapport. Maybe you've done scenes where they are interacting and which are more conventionally dramatic, so they don't feel so alone when they're doing those scenes because they already have um, inhabited a character. Uh, so you would probably not want to start with scenes where they are, um, that's important, scheduling. So the first scenes that uh, David Thewlis had were the scenes in jail with his daughter. So he had all that material that he's actually shot already to think about as he's going about the inspections. If he'd done the inspections first, it wouldn't have had the same tone. So in terms of everything we were talking about, um, scheduling, um, then there's the AD's work and your work with the AD to figure out which scenes you would ideally like to shoot because that order of that will have an impact on the performance. Fantastic. Well, I have to end here um, because Catherine Middleton's standing up. Um, so uh, I'll thank you very much for f fantastic questions and for your engagement with thank you. Adam's film. Thank you. And thank you, thank Adam. You, thank you.